All right, uh, the title this morning is Convictions of the Conscience, Convictions of the Conscience. So I'm preaching on this topic again, just because I think it's very important. I think many of us were not there when I preached it last. And I just think it's a very important topic um, and, and re relevant to something I want to preach next week. So I wanted to preach sort of this in depth so you understood the concept first, and then, then we can talk about some uh, relevant things to this time um, next week. Convictions of the conscience, convictions of the conscience. So it's, it's important that we understand um, the difference between um, a commandment, which is a statement within the Bible, and a conviction, which is something that we, um, I guess, hold to based on the knowledge that we have, based on our conscience, on what that principle gives us, right? Now, if we do not make this distinction, right? We don't understand what I want to teach you in this sermon. Um, there's a couple of dangers. One is, in 1 Corinthians 10, we read in verse 29, he says, Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. He says, for why is my liberty, right? My freedom to do things, right? In Christ, judged of another man's conscience. So you see, like, if we don't understand the difference between a commandment and a conviction, what we might end up doing is we might end up condemning somebody, not for a commandment in the Bible, but for a conviction that we hold, right? And people can have those, we can have those views, but we also need to understand that people have liberty to make certain choices, right, in their life. The other thing that we run the danger of doing is in Matthew 15, verse 8, this people draweth nigh unto me with their lips, with their, nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Now, what's the, the problem in this passage? Well, in verse 9, it says here, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now, why does this happen in churches? Why does this happen where preachers and Bible teachers end up teaching for doctrines the commandments of men? Because they don't distinguish between what the Bible actually says and what the conviction that they have held to based on those verses. So then rather than teaching, this is what the Bible says, and this is what I, how I believe how the Bible should be applied in this and this circumstance, and, and, and making it clear that one is their, what the Bible says, and one is their conviction, they just start teaching their convictions as this is what the Bible says. The Bible tells you to do, insert my conviction here, and they end up teaching for commandments, uh, teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. Now it's not wrong to teach your convictions. I just think it's important to make it clear that those are convictions and for people to understand the difference between what the Bible says and what the Bible does not say. And that doesn't mean that any conviction that somebody has should not be taken heed to, right? Convictions are things that, you know, may be very wise for us to do. Um, and it should, and it may be a conviction that you ought to take on yourself. But that's what we're gonna talk about sort of through this sermon, right? So the first thing I want to talk about is just talk about some definitions, right? So the first section is going to be the difference between a commandment. So we've got commandments and we've got convictions and then we have preferences, right? Commandments, convictions, and preferences. So commandments is quite easy, right? Commandments, so what is a commandment? A commandment is a clear statement in, in Scripture. We see here uh, Jesus saying in verse 20, of Luke 18, thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. So these are commandments are clear statements in scripture. It's what the Bible actually says. And when the Bible actually says something, this gives us the guiding principles in order to figure out how we should apply things in different situations in our life. Right? So that's what commandments are. Now, what is a conviction? Um, now, the word convicted is used once in the Bible. We can get an idea of how, what, where this word, when we talk about convictions, come from. Right? Convictions is positions that we hold to. But obviously, convicted to be convicted means you, you feel guilty about something. But when we talk about convictions, it's positions we hold to in regard to what we believe is right and wrong. Right? So... In here in John 8 verse 9, it says, And they which heard it, so this is talking about the uh, woman caught in adultery, and then after Jesus says, you know, he is without sin, cast the first stone. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, 
went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. So you can see here that your, convi your convictions and what convicts you is, is closely related to what your conscience tells you, right? So what is your conscience? So a conviction is a belief you hold regarding what is right or wrong based on your conscience. So then the question is, well, what is my conscience? Because right? some people think your conscience is like, uh, you know, they, they have like the, the, the angels that sit on your, your right and left shoulder and it's kind of like, you know, when you need to make a decision, it's like poof, and then it's like the, the red, the devil telling you to do wrong and then uh, the white one telling you what's right. So your conscience is, is you, right? But it's not like this, it's this, this separate force. You don't want to think it's like just this separate force that's not you in you. What I believe your conscience is, um, so your conscience is what judges from wrong, right from wrong, based on your own knowledge and wisdom, right? So it's not like just this other inner voice that just lives inside you, just talking to you. That's not you. It's actually you, but it's, it's, the, it's, it's what you are telling yourself based on what you know. Right? And, based, and what you know may be based on experience, it may, be, may be based on advice, it may be based on things that you've read, but it also is based on innate knowledge that God has put in you as well. So that's why when we say like, well, you're con you just know consciously that that's right or wrong, what we're referring to is that besides the things that you've learnt and the wisdom and your experiences that you've had and the situations that you know in order to guide your conscience, there's also things that God has just innately put in you so that you know these things are right and wrong even without experiencing it, right? So that's what I believe your conscience is. It's kind of like that inner knowledge that you have, whether you've learnt it or not based on experience or knowledge, that then guides you to make decisions, right? Now, you may not always follow your conscience, right? Because your conscience may tell you, you know, I really shouldn't be doing that, but then your flesh overcomes that conscience and you end up doing things. But that's why you're convicted by your own conscience, because even though you may do something, your conscience might tell you, you know, you shouldn't really be doing that, because the knowledge that you have, you know, I shouldn't be doing that. So you see how it's, it's not that it's just some other force. It's actually just you with your knowledge that you have. That's your conscience. Because what does the word conscience really mean? I mean, conscience, people break it down. They say con is with and science is knowledge. So you see how it's the decisions you make with the knowledge that you have, right? That's what your conscience is. So this is why your conscience can convict you because it's the knowledge that you actually have within yourself. And like I said, that knowledge can come from different places. And that's why your conscience... Your conscience, whether somebody feels guilty about something or whether they feel that that's the right thing to do, can change. Why? Because the knowledge that you have can change. Right? You might feel guilty about something and then you learn, wait a second, that's not actually wrong. You know, I've misunderstood the Bible. Or I've gotten some knowledge. Or now I, you know, I've tried to piece some things together and you're like, okay, that's why I don't feel guilty about this anymore because I don't actually believe it's wrong anymore based on the knowledge I have. So you can see how that, the knowledge that you get and the experience you have, you see that that ties into whether or not your conscience convicts you or not based on what you do because it's based on the knowledge. Now, some things, no matter what you learn or what you experience, you always feel guilty about because look at what it says here in Romans 2 verse 14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, he's saying so these nations that don't have the laws of God do by nature, what do they do? They naturally do the things contained in the law. Why? These, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. So that even though they don't have God's law, governing their society. Why do they end up governing themselves the same way that God's law would govern them? It says here, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. What's that? Like either condemning or saying it's, it's okay. So you see there this, this idea that the conscience, why, why is your conscience bearing witness? Because the knowledge that you have in you bearing witness of what is right and wrong. And he's saying here that even these nations that don't have the law, they still innately know what is certain things that are right and wrong. Now, um, you know, then we're going to talk about how these things can be applied, right? So hopefully that clears up a bit. So I've just have, I've been having to think about like, hey, what is the difference between commandments, convictions, and conscience? And I think that's a, a better definition of what I've explained before, but um, tried to make it a bit more clearer for you guys. So you have commandments, what the Bible says, 
you have convictions, which is the positions or the beliefs you have based on how you apply those things, what you judge to be right and wrong based on experience, knowledge, even innate knowledge that God has given you. And then you have preferences. So a preference is like a position you hold to, but it's not a matter of right and wrong, right? So it's like you have a preference of chocolate ice cream, but you don't believe that people that eat strawberry ice cream are sinning, right, are doing wrong. So preferences are something you prefer, but not, are not necessarily right and wrong. And then from your convictions and your preferences, people create rules, right? They create standards. So this is where, you know, an employer might set standards for his company. Um, you know, churches might set standards for a church. And they come from our convictions and our preferences. Um, and this is where you get this saying, right? Where people say the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart because it's alluding to this idea that we have convictions which are based on what we believe about things but are not necessarily clearly stated in the Bible. Yes, we're given that, that principle, but how we apply it is often a matter of the heart. And you see it as well in law, you know, like when, we, when, we, when you talk about going to law, you know, they have certain laws in place, but then the judge has to decide how he's going to apply that law. And that's the same thing. We're reading God's law. That law doesn't change. But then we, as judges ourselves, you know, we have to decide how we're going to apply that law, and this is what convictions of the conscience are. Now, the two main passages, we're going to look at relevant scriptures. The two main passages that allude to this concept is 1 Corinthians 10 and Romans 14. So we'll just go over 1 Corinthians 10 and see what he's talking about, and then we'll go to Romans 14. So 1 Corinthians 10, 19 says, What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols, anything? So you can see here the context is about eating things sacrificed to idols. And he's basically saying here that, you know, idols really aren't anything. They're just people that, things that people believe. But the idol in and of itself is nothing. So if somebody sacrificed something that doesn't exist, I mean, is it changing the food? This is sort of what he's saying. He says, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. So he's saying, but the reason why people do this is because it's not that the idol is anything. It's because they want a fellowship with devils devils with a false god and then you don't want to participate in that because you don't want to participate in fellowshipping with a devil but the, the point that he's sort of making through this passage is that if you eat something sacrificed to, to an idol it's not that you've in, innately sinned in and of itself it's not that you have um, you know eaten something that has now defiled your body but it's the mere fact that when somebody else believes that they have they are communing with devils and then you commune with them you're actually sinning against them by making like sort of validating what they're believing right this is the whole idea here he says do we provoke the lord to jealousy are we stronger than he look at this all things are lawful for me so we can't take this verse out of context right he's not saying that there's no such thing as sin and that everything is to his right he's talking about in the context of these things that are matters of the conscience right convictions of the conscience where he's saying like hey when he's saying all things are lawful for me, he's saying I can eat anything. Right? There's nothing that I can't eat. But he's saying, but all things are not expedient. What does that mean? But all things are not necessarily beneficial to others, right? And not a good thing to do. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not, right? They don't help build up others. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's, another's wealth. So you can see here these principles that we are being taught here that what we should strive to do, we should strive to do what's best by God and strive to do what's best by others. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. What are the shambles? The shambles is like the street markets, like the marketplace. It's like if you go eat and you buy some food, you just eat it, asking no question for conscience sake. So that ties into, you know, when I explained to you what the conscience is, you see how like, because you, you don't, he's saying just, if you're just ignorant about where it comes from, then your conscience may not tell you whether or not to eat it or not, right? Because the knowledge you have, you're ignorant about where this food came from. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And he's saying, that's fine. You know, just eat it because everything in the earth belongs to the Lord. You're not sinning by eating anything that's in there. Verse 27, but if any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, so you're invited over by an unbeliever, and ye be disposed to go. So, you know, you know this person, you, you go to the feast. Whatsoever is set before you, eat 
asking no question for conscience sake. So you see again how it's like, all right, you go to an unbeliever's house, they give you food, you just don't ask, you don't have to ask, or oh, is this offered to idols? You just eat it, you're not doing anything wrong. For conscience sake, why? Because you are not, have no knowledge about what, what, how this food was prepared, where did it come from? But if any man say unto you, right, so now you have some information that may alter your decision making and your conscience, right, the knowledge that you have, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols. Look at this. Eat not for his sake that showed it and for conscience sake. So it's saying now you shouldn't eat it for his sake, but also now that you know this is sacrificed to idols and then he's actually invited you to a feast to partake with devils, now you know this. So he's saying now you know you shouldn't eat of it. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Why? Because you ought to do things for God. So you can see how... He's taking that same principle, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, but you see the situation changes how he applies this principle. So there's a great example here in 1 Corinthians 10 of how the Bible can say something, but he's showing us, hey, this is how you apply it differently based on the circumstances and the information you have. But he says, he says eat it not for conscience sake. It's, a, it's not only your own knowledge. He says here in verse 29, conscience, I say, not thine own. Why? Because you know there's nothing wrong eating this food. He says, conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? So he's saying, just because this person's conscience is telling him that he's doing it in, in, in for idols, he says, that doesn't condemn you, but you're doing it knowing that you're strengthening that conscience of his, that it's okay for him to do. This is what it's saying in 1 Corinthians 10. For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? He's saying, there's nothing wrong if I give thanks for this food and I'm eating it. But, he says in verse 31, but whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. So there's that principle of we always consider our actions, how it affects God, how it affects others. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Right? So, 1 Corinthians 10 is talking about striving to do what's best by God, what's best by others. So, really, one thing we can really gather from 1 Corinthians 10 is if somebody has an attitude of, um, I don't care what anyone thinks. I don't care how this affects others. We know that that's already a wrong attitude to have. Right? But does that mean that everybody else dictates what is right and wrong for us? No. Right? So it's about the consideration of how it affects others, not necessarily that we must never offend anyone else because you know, sometimes doing the right thing may offend others, but it's the attitude of consideration of, hmm, how does this affect God? Does this affect others? We shouldn't have the attitude of, I don't care who this affects. I have the liberty to do what I want. Right? And that's the wrong attitude. The other one is Romans 14. Romans 14, it's got similar themes here in, in eating, but it's a little bit different because 1 Corinthians 10 is about eating things sacrificed unto idols. Romans 14, it says, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputation. So that's the word the Bible uses when it comes to matters of the conscience. Doubtful disputations, it's, it's things that people argue over, right? But you can never come to a conclusion because... They're doubtful, right? You don't really know what is 100% true because it's convictions of the conscience, right? For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. So here's one example that he used in Romans 14. The people who choose to refrain from eating meat for whatever reason they believe. Sometimes, you know, that, that's, a, that's an, an issue as well of a matter of conscience where somebody may have been brought up believing it's cruel and shouldn't eat animals and respect all life. And then they learn from the Bible, oh wait, Jesus you know, made animals for us to eat, Jesus ate fish, and now their conscience changes. It's not actually wrong, but they may still just, you know, out of growing up, not eating meat, still choose not to do it because they can't stomach it, right? So we have to understand that people have these situations where they may decide not to eat meat. Maybe they do it for health reasons. Somebody may be a vegan or a vegetarian because they believe it's more healthy. Um, so this is the scenario here. One person believes that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs, right? Just vegetables. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God had received him. So 
So it's here about respecting each other's choices and each other's liberty that we have and not condemning one another for these choices that are not really that important, you know, in terms of what you choose to be your diet. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Now he goes on to a different topic. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. So what is this talking about? This is talking about holidays. Right? You have, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses are famous for, you know, you can't celebrate birthdays, and you can't celebrate Christmas, and you can't celebrate Easter, and you can't celebrate anniversaries, and you can't, you know, have any sort of celebration because they're all pagan, and anything you're doing is pagan. And don't you know that pagans celebrate their birthday? So how dare you celebrate your birthday? Now you can see why it's never conclusive, right? Because these are convictions of the conscience. They have this idea, and they may, their conscience may tell them not to do that, but like the Bible says here, well, but if one person wants to set one day aside and do special days, and, and this would include Sabbaths, right? Like where people think that one day is more important that you should set aside. He's saying here that, hey, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So we see here that the topic of holy days and holidays and special days is a matter of the conscience, whether you believe they are right to do or wrong to do, but there's no definite right or wrong, right? It's an issue of the conscience. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. Right? So he's saying people have can have the right intentions behind what they're doing. Just because somebody doesn't have a different conviction to you doesn't mean that they have bad motives or bad intentions. So it's like here, somebody may be refraining from doing something or doing something, but they're doing it for God. Just like you're doing it for God, right? But you have different convictions. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? Right? So this idea of condemning others for convictions they hold that are not, you know, really that important, and, and really in, these, in, this, in this context of things. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, for it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block on occasion to fall in his brother's way. So he's saying, don't condemn people for whose convictions differ. One thing as well is we should first assume people have good intentions, right? Before we just assume that the reason why they have this conviction is because they want to sin against God. and Because that always happens, right? So somebody has a different opinion. You think, oh, because you, you, you don't care about the commandments of God. You just want, you know, just live however you want and whatever. And you want to encourage others to live however you want rather than them having actually good reasons for what they do. Um, verse 14, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. And I think this is a good principle for us to learn here, and this is why I'm at Romans 14. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So what's interesting here that even though convictions of the conscience are not wrong in and of themselves, if you believe them to be wrong, right? So where you sin against your own conscience, that's what people say. So when you sin against your own conscience, is that the knowledge that you have is telling you that it's wrong and that you do it anyway, you are actually in sin, even though the Bible doesn't specifically state it. That's what this is saying. So if you believe it's wrong to celebrate a certain holiday and then you do celebrate it, you are in sin, right? Or if you do a certain act and you say, you know what, I really shouldn't be doing this, as a believer in God or a believer in Jesus Christ, and then you go and do it, you are in sin, even though the Bible doesn't explicitly condemn that activity. That's what this is saying. So there's nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything. If you believe it's unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. This is about considering how it affects others too. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. Right? For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace 
and things wherewith one may edify another. So again, you see that same sort of theme in 1 Corinthians 10, that we're trying to do what's best by other people. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with the fence. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. So it's this idea that I'm willing to refrain from what I have the liberty to do to help somebody else, if it's best for them. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So you see that if you don't believe it's right to do, and you do it, the Bible says here you're in sin. Now James 4.17 basically says this statement the other way around. So if you think about it here in uh, Romans 14, what it's saying here is, if you believe it is wrong to do, and you do it, it's, it's sin, right? He that, he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So you see how there it's saying, if you believe something's wrong to do, and you do it anyway, you're in sin. Now James 4 says it the opposite way, right? The opposite. He says here, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Right? So you, you say it's both ways. You say, I don't think that's right to do. You do it anyway, that's sin. But if your conscience says, you know what, that's actually the right thing to do, and you don't do it, that's also sin. And you're refraining from what the right thing to do is. Right? So it's, it's very interesting that the Bible says this both ways. And, and that's why, you know, I have said this many times in the past, that often, you know, God's judgments and commandments set principles. And really, if you follow your conscience, your standards would be, would be a lot higher, right, than even the Bible states, right? Because the Bible states certain things, but it kind of gives us an underlying principle. But it's our convictions that then build those standards on those. And with the knowledge that we have, you know, our, our, our convictions is really what gives us this high standard. Because it's not only just refraining from doing wrong things. It's if you knew something, know something is good to do and it's best to do, you should do that too, right? So, focus more on making sure your own actions are guided by love for others. Some things are not worth destroying relationships over. These are the sort of things that we're learning in Romans 14. So, let's talk about practical applications. I'll try and blow through some of these because there's a lot of them. But before we get into practical applications, so questions to help you determine your convictions, right? Because you have to understand in Christianity, not everything is spelled out for you. You know, when you're a young Christian, you want just somebody to just tell you, just, just tell me what I should do, right? Just tell me if I, this decision, that decision, what should I wear? How should I put my hair? Should I wear makeup or not? Are these shoes okay? You know, are they godly? Are these pants okay? You know, you just want somebody to tell you, what sort of job should I do? Where should I live? But you have liberty to, to make these decisions, right? And you know, your conscience is going to guide you based on, like I said, the, the knowledge that God has given you, based on what the Bible says, but also based on what other people may think as well. You need to take these into consideration. These are going to help your decision making when it comes to convictions of the conscience. So, what are some questions you can ask yourself? One is, the famous one, what would Jesus do? Right? That's why, that's why that exists, right? Because people, they need to ask themselves, what would Jesus do in this instance? Because it's really addressing matters of the heart where well, I ha I ha I've not been given this direct guidance. So what do I think Jesus would do in this instance? Right? And that's really coming back to you know, applying all the knowledge you have about God's word and what you know about Jesus in the specific scenario that you find yourself in. Is this the right thing to do? Am I putting God first? Am I doing my best? Am I doing what is best for others? What about this one? Will what I do encourage someone else to do right or wrong? Right? That's something to ask ourselves too whenever we decide what's the right or wrong thing to do. So am I being a good example to others? Is this, you know, you can ask yourself, is this the sort of world that I want to live in? Right? If people did this. Um, what would my husband, father, my bishop or other godly mentor or friend, what would they think if I did this, 
right? This is why the Bible talks about in a multitude of counselors there is safety because that counsel and that experience is being added to the knowledge that you have, the conscience, so that when your conscience is making a decision, it is not only taking into account your own experience and your own learnings, but it's also the experience of others and the advice from others, right? So this is why counsel is important too. What would the church think? You know, what would society think? Right? So these are the sort of questions we ask ourselves when we decide what are the right things to do. So let's do some practical applications. Right? We already talked about, I won't go so much into 1 Corinthians 10, but you know, in 1 Corinthians 10, we talked about eating things sacrificed to idols. Um, so they knew, So what's, what's the practical application in, in this life? Or well, people might say, well, should I be eating halal? <laughs> right? Should I be eating halal food? Well, you know, if nobody knows you're eating something and it's halal, you're not affecting anyone, right? So it's not actually wrong to eat halal foods, but you might say, you know, I don't want any, your conscience might go, you know what, I don't even want to support halal certification because the money that I'm spending on this halal food is then going to fund halal certification, which is then donated to, like, I don't know, Muslim terrorist organizations or jihadi organizations, whatever. So you can see there that the Bible doesn't say don't eat halal, right? So you see the commandment is you shouldn't eat things sacrificed to idols, right? But then... You know, should you eat halal or not? Well, I guess it depends on that scenario. So it's not necessarily sinful in every instance. I mean, if you're starving and the only food available to you is halal, are you sinning? No. See, so you see how it's the situation may change whether your conscience convicts you or whether you're doing right or wrong. So it's the same that if you eat at a restaurant, right? You eat at a restaurant and maybe it's a, it's a pagan restaurant. They're Buddhist or they're Muslim or whatever. Like here, the, the principle we can get here is, well, just don't ask about it. Just eat it. If nobody knows, you, you know none the bet, wiser. What does it matter? Because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But if, a, a, you know, if somebody invites you to a feast and then they have some ceremony, that's when you say, look, you know, I'm, I'm not going to eat because I don't want to validate what you're doing here, right? So, but you're not necessarily doing it for your own conscience sake. You're doing it for their sake. Now, Romans 14, we talked about already vegetarians and vegans, Right? But another one we see here is the celebrating of birthdays, holidays, weddings, and funerals. So, uh, you know, funerals, weddings, uh, all sorts of things. I mean, people who are against, you know, celebrating holy days like Easter and Christmas, I mean, it's, they're only one step away from saying you shouldn't have a wedding, you shouldn't have a birthday. You know, because they already believe that, you know, you know how they justify it? They say, well, because Herod celebrated his birthday in the Bible. See how pagans do it? You have a birthday, you're a pagan too. See, so they, there's ways they can justify it, but... It's an issue of the conscience. I mean, if you believe it's a pagan practice, you may not want to do it, but you just can't condemn others for doing the same thing. 1 Corinthians 6, I won't read this for sake, the whole thing for sake of time, but the, the, the concept here is in verse 16, when he says, what, um, uh, no, not verse 16, uh, verse 19, he says, see, what, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So what does the Bible actually say? What's the commandment? The commandment is your body's not your own and that you ought to glorify God with your body because your body doesn't belong to you. Now, what the Bible does not say is, um, you know, that smoking is a sin. Right? But then how do people come to that conclusion? Well, they say, because smoking has no other purpose, you know, than to, I guess, well, I guess people can say, well, I just enjoy it. But then somebody might have the conviction where they say, you know, smoking is smelly, you know, smoking destroys your health. And therefore, I don't believe I'm, my conviction is telling me I'm not actually taking care of my body. But for somebody to say smoking is a sin without giving you the explanation of why they believe it's a sin, they may risk that danger of teaching for commandments the doctrines of men. But you can see how, wisdom might dictate that smoking is bad for your health and there's really no good reason. It wastes a lot of money. Now your conscience might go, even though I smoke because, you know, I believe it's justified that we can just enjoy things now and then because people will say, well, smoking is no different to like, you know, eating chocolate or having a, a nice drink, just enjoying a little thing here and there, you know. But then they might say, you know what, I don't like the smell, the image, the money wasted. So their conscience might be telling, you know what, I really shouldn't be doing this. If they continue to smoke, then they're in sin, right? But then if they can really justify to themselves that, hey, it's just this little thing, you know, you know, it's, this is why in order to convince somebody out of doing these sort of bad habits, it's, it's a matter of the conscience. Can you convince them 
and give them the knowledge and the wisdom and the counsel to say, look, this is not a good decision you're making to ch alter their conscience. And then that's how, you know, you kind of make it a sin for them. Rather than just telling them the Bible is a sin for them, you need to convince them um, through their conscience. So, like on the same vein of smoking, any sort of addiction, any sort of drugs, right? I mean, they fit into this category where you, it's hard to just flatline outlaw them, but you can give good reasons for why Christians shouldn't do them. And, and this is usually the passage. So we talked about smoking, um, you know, but people could say the same thing about coffee, right? People that drink coffee, they're addicted to coffee. Should you be addicted to something, you know? You shouldn't be. You shouldn't be brought under the power of any, the Bible says. Um, on the same vein as well, this is not just talking about negative things. This is also telling people, hey, they should be healthy. You know, if you're not eating healthy, taking care of everybody, you're not exercising, right? You're not keeping yourself fit. This or this passage ought to convict you. They'll say like, well, this body is not my own. I better take care of it. So it's not just not trashing it. Right? It's also making sure that my body is fit and healthy and strong because it doesn't belong to me as well. I should take care of it. Just like if somebody gets you to take care of something, you should clean it, keep it nice and neat. Um, that's, that's one way that we are a good steward of our bodies. Um, what about tattoos? You know, people talk about tattoos, right? Uh, this is where the passage they go to talk about tattoos. Leviticus 19, 28. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. So what does the Bible actually say? The Bible actually says, so this, this verse, even though people think that the Bible is condemning tattoos, right? it's not actually condemning tattoos. This is actually talking about making cuttings or marks in your flesh for the dead. Now, if somebody actually does do that, if somebody puts a tattoo on them and it's like in remembrance of somebody, that's dead, I think they actually are in sin because I think they... It'd be hard for them to justify how they're not breaking this commandment. But, but if somebody's just getting tattoos because they feel like it's a decoration, you know, some people take this, this principle so far as to say, you know, you know, people take notes on their palm, you know, with a pen, and they'll say like, oh, you, well, they say you shouldn't have tattoos. Why should you be graffitiing on God's property? So you can understand how they come to that conviction. But the point I'm trying to make here is you can see how what the Bible actually says is not to do it for the dead not print any marks upon you. So could I say that tattoos in and of themselves are a sin? No. What, I, what would I have to say to somebody to sort of advise them against it? To say, look, you know, is, is it wise how you look? You know, people get the tattoos all over their face and then it's hard for them to get a job, you know? And other thing is like, you know, is it worth the money? Is it a good use of your money? It's very expensive to get all these tattoos. And then it's like, do you want to be so foolish to print something permanently on yourself that now, you know, you're, you're, you do it when you're like an adolescent and you're foolish and then you, now you can't even scrape it off your body, right? You need to get it surgically removed and it's scarred. So it's just like not a wise thing to do. But ultimately, people have to make their own choice. But they may take that advice and that counsel and go, you know what? I don't think this is the best thing to do with God's body, right? And that's how we sort of have to teach these things. Alcohol is another one. So I'll try and go through some of these examples really quick. Ephesians 5.18, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So a lot of people believe, and I don't, that it's a sin just to consume any amount of alcohol. If we look at this verse, it says, that, be not drunk with wine where is in excess. So if somebody was drunk with wine, then I do believe that they have committed this sin. But you can obviously consume a little bit of alcohol without being drunk. Now, somebody might have the conviction where they go, you know what, since drinking alcohol could lead to drunkenness, I'm going to abstain from it completely. Now, do they have the liberty to, to do that? Of course. And if they believe that's the right thing to do and they don't do it, they're in sin. But you can see how, again, we want to make that distinction between what does the Bible actually teach versus the convictions that we hold to. What's another one? This is the verse that is often alluded to when we talk about how church is done. Right? 1 Corinthians 14 says, Let all things be done decently and in order. So again, the commandment or what the statement of the Bible is, is that everything is done decently and in order. But what does that mean? Right? So when it comes to things like, you know, church activities, how should they be run? Right? Uh, what should be allowed at church activities? So, so one thing like, that I think, you know, um, 
you know, in terms of how people should dress at church activities and things like that. So, or the order in which you do things. How long should church last? What's the name of the church? What about the titles within the church? Whether or not have children's church? You know, a lot of people are really against children's church. And just as I, as I mentioned some of these topics, these are probably things that you know Christians debate and argue about to no end. Why is there never any conclusion? Because these are convictions of the conscience, aren't they? Style of music. You know, whether you have altar calls in church. How you take up offering. Whether you take up offering. Dress standards. Length of the sermon. Use of technology. Right? Who you associate or fellowship with as a church. Hey, the amount you should give to church. How you do communion. That's a conviction as well. Because it's like, you know, we can see how Jesus did it, but that's not a commandment. That's just a, that's just a precedent, right? So we can try and see. We try and copy it as close as possible. But if people do it differently, are they in sin? No, because it's a conviction of the conscience. What about baptism? That's the same, right? How we baptize and, you know, what we say when we baptize, all those sorts of things. What are some others? Dress in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. So we see here that the Bible tells us that we should, or women, should dress modestly. But what is modest? Right? This is a conviction of the conscience. Right? So dress standards, whether formal or informal, lengths of skirts, tightness, materials, colors, right? all these things. Um, you know, this is why, you know, in this vein of thought as well, people might say, you know, this is why mixed swimming is bad. You know, have you ever heard of that? People say you shouldn't be mixed swimming because the, the, the idea is, oh, you know, when you get wet, then your clothes get tighter. So that's why it's like you shouldn't be mixed swimming. But this is a conviction of the conscience. These are not sins in and of themselves. Um, you know, breastfeeding in public, you know. So there was a big argument amongst fundamental circles about whether or not women should be allowed to uncover themselves to breastfeed the child. Do they have to cover up? And then people are saying, well, it's obviously a sin because you shouldn't be sure. Well, these are convictions, right? So convictions is, so because it's not a sin in and of itself to reveal your nakedness or to reveal your breasts even because your breasts are not considered nakedness. But then the question is, is it modest? Is it drawing the wrong sort of attention? Can you do it in a way? So these are the sort of questions that we need to ask about breastfeeding. Pants on women is another one. Deuteronomy 22 verse 5, the women shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. So what is the commandment? The commandment is that the women don't wear men's clothes and the men don't wear women's clothes. But the Bible doesn't tell us what is men and women's clothes. And God has left that for us to determine based on conscience, right? Based on different things. So, for example, colors. You may say, oh, pants is a man's garment. But then, is that the case? You know, doesn't that depend on society? Doesn't that depend on culture? What about colors? You say, well, you're wearing a girl's color because girls, color, girls wear pink and boys wear blue. That's a conviction of the conscience too. Um, that might be a wise thing to do. I mean, why would you want to, say, put your baby boy into a pink onesie? You know, obviously, it's going to make people think that it's a girl and maybe make them think that you buy into this whole gender-bending uh, philosophy. You may not want to do that. But are you sinning in and of itself? No. Length of hair is another one. 1 Corinthians 11, 14 to 15. You know, if a man have long hair, is it shame unto him? If a woman have long hair, is it glory for her? So we know the Bible talks about long hair for women and short hair for men. But how long is long and how short is short? That's a conviction of the conscience. A few other ones. Um, First Thessalonians, Thessalonians 5, abstain from all appearance of evil. I've often used this one or heard this one used when it comes to dating, right? Dating methods, right? And you say, well, what we're doing is not necessarily wrong, but then it's like, do you want to be seen as doing something wrong? You know, do you want to be going off alone in a dark alley? You know, it's like, yeah, well, we're just doing something. We're just having a chat. But it's like, yeah, but it doesn't look good, right? So, the Bible just says abstain from all appearance of evil, but it doesn't tell you exactly how to go about that. So not only with dating methods, right, but it also might be who you associate with. Right? You may not want to be friends with a certain somebody because of 
the association might bring. You know, as a business partner, you might not want to be a business partner with somebody that's had corrupt dealings in the past, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong that they may uh, be a good business partner. So two more examples. One is when it comes to children, it says, and God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply. So the Bible says, be fruitful and multiply. But the Bible doesn't tell us how many. Is, has somebody been fruitful and multiplied if they have three children? Just as much as they have 10 children? Well, you know, technically they, they have. So this is why as well, when I talk about having children and whatnot, you'll see that when I talk to people about encouraging them to have more children, I talk about, hey, the value of children and what are you weighing it up against? But I don't take the hardline stance that people will say, well, then just all birth control and all family planning is all sinful because there are situations when it may be wise to do, right? And um, we, we've, we've known of situations like that. And I've experienced situations like that when I think it was wise to do that, um, um, but it wasn't always done. So, uh, Deuteronomy uh, 6, 6 to 7. This is the last one I'll talk about before we conclude. Deuteronomy 6 says here, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, when thou risest up. Now this verse is often used to promote homeschool. Right? And you guys know that I'm a proponent for homeschooling. But I'm not for arguing it this way. Like the way a lot of homeschooling proponents will argue this stuff, say like, look, the Bible is commanding that thou, this is, this is singular, the, thou, thy, thou, thy. So you see how you should be responsible for teaching your children? That's why you should homeschool, right? because you have to teach them. But you can see how they've taken the commandment of the Bible, which is that you are responsible for teaching your children, to say that you therefore must be the only tutor that you engage to teach your children, right? Now, is there some wisdom in homeschooling? Obviously, because I think, it, you know, this is why it comes to convictions, right? I say, I don't think it's wise that full-time somebody has the responsibility of your children because how much can you influence them when you're never with them and you send them somewhere else for six hours a day, five days a week? But you can't take it to the extreme that you must do all instruction because then, then are they allowed to have a soccer coach? Are they allowed to have a jiu-jitsu coach? Are you allowed to take them for swimming lessons? So obviously you don't teach them everything. But I think what we learn from this passage is that you are primarily responsible for making sure they learn these things. Now, how you go about doing that is a conviction of the conscience. But, you know, that may sway to what extent your involvement in a school may be, right? And whether it's wise for you to just send them away and just be taught by some unbeliever for five days of the week, six days uh, six hours of the day. Okay, so in conclusion, just a few closing thoughts. So hopefully this concept is clear. I, think, I just think it's so important that people understand this because it'll make you wiser in how you determine what is right and wrong, right? But inevitably what happens when somebody learns this truth, right, learns this concept of Christianity, you may feel like a level of uncertainty because you sort of think, well, now I don't have this sort of definitive standard to adhere to. But that's okay because, you know, in Christianity, that's how Christianity is. There are not always definitive standards for us to adhere to. We're given commandments, we're given principles, and then we have to determine, using our conscience, what are our convictions that we're going to take. So I say to people that you can take consolation in the certainty that some things in Christianity are not certain, right? So we know that that is certain, that some things are, are not certain. Now, just because something is a conviction, that doesn't mean it's not important, right? So I don't want you to have this idea that, oh, okay, well, these are convictions, then it doesn't really matter what I do. No, no, these things are very important because the choices you make, like I said, it sets an example, can affect other people, and you know what I mean? It, 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 it is important, the positions that you take and the convictions you have. But... What I'm trying to make clear from this sermon is we can't change the commandments in order to change people's convictions. We need to convince people with the knowledge and the experience and advice how to change the convictions. And even though that might be a tougher job 
to convince people to change their convictions, I think ultimately it's a much more sound position and then it doesn't raise Christians and raise children not really understanding why they do things, right? Because if you just drill convictions into people and then they learn for themselves, they're going to realize, wait a second, the Bible doesn't actually teach this. Right? I think that's a much more dangerous um, teaching to build up in. So remember, we need to distinguish between them. Otherwise, we might judge others by our own conscience or be judged by another person's conscience or we might teach for doctrines the commandments of men right all right let's pray thank you lord for this lesson um or not no it's not so much of an exciting sermon but an important one nonetheless i pray lord that you help people to understand this truth lord and lord not use it as a license to reduce their standards but lord may we increase our standards and be truthful to our conscience. And uh, I pray, Lord, that our conscience will convict us to increase our standards and our example and our way of living, um, not to use it as justification to decrease our, the way we live for you. So I pray, Lord, for these things and ask you to, to bless this uh, teaching. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.